Welcome back. I'm Sharmini Paris coming to you from Baltimore. And we're speaking with Mark Weisbrot about his latest book, Failed, What the Experts Got Wrong, about the global economy. In segment one, we talked about Europe. And in segment two, we're gonna talk about the IMF, uh, one component of the Troika. And, uh, and uh, Mark, it's good to have you back. Great to be here. So Mark, uh, in your book, um, you dedicate a lot of time to the IMF. And, um, and the IMF, of course, has uh, in the past been a leader of the neoliberal uh, mission across the world, in the third world, and, and uh, recently we've seen their role um, in the Troika uh, in Europe in facilitating uh, some of the so-called debt crises that the Europe is doing, uh, dealing with, particularly Greece. Um, they had a prominent role. Uh, but you also uh, indicate in your book that uh, this role is changing. Um, so I want to uh, hear about how it is changing. Well, I'd like to report that they decided to abandon their failed uh, policies. And, you know, you do see changes in the research department. For example, in last month, there was an article in their quarterly magazine by two IMF economists. Uh, or maybe it was three, but there were IMF economists say it was called uh, neoliberalism oversold with a question mark. And that was an interesting article where they were actually criticizing it. Now, unfortunately, that doesn't, uh, that just represents the views of those economists. But you are seeing some changes in the research department, but it hasn't really uh, changed their policy. The big change that took place in the 21st century with the IMF, which was completely, uh, almost completely ignored in the major media, was that it lost most of its power in uh, developing countries, in low and middle income countries. And that was really big, it was big for the United States too, because this was the main avenue of influence, the biggest one uh, for the United States uh, on the economic policy Give of us some other countries. Uh, of the IMF influence? Yes, and how it has been dissipating. Sure, well, here's an example. When uh, Lula da Silva was running for president of Brazil in 2002, uh, he sat down with his opponents and with the IMF, and the IMF told them what their economic policy was going to be no matter who was elected their most important economic policies, for example, their fiscal policy and how big their uh, primary budget surplus was going to be for the next couple of years. And they did that in return uh, for a loan. And so that was just one example. I mean, you can go to back a few more years, actually just that period from 1998 to 2002, Argentina suffered a great depression while it was under IMF agreements that told them to do uh, similar things that were really, you know, the kind of austerity that we saw in Europe that really worsened their uh, economy and kept them in depression. And so uh, there are countless examples of this. Uh, and what happened was, uh, whole, well, I won't well, go Well, there's a huge political change. I mean, with President Chavez coming to power in Venezuela, with uh, President Evo Morales coming to power in Bolivia. That's a very good example. In, in, in uh, Ecuador, um, Korea. I mean, these are people who are a bit more economically savvy and knew what the World Bank and the IMF and the WTO had been doing to ordinary people. So with the swing um, in, in Latin America in terms of uh, the leftward swing uh, and the consciousness of the people leading it, they decided to reject uh, the IMF, and you write about that in the book. That was a big part of it, just the election of left governments that started in 1998. You know, at that time, you didn't have any left governments. And, uh, you know, by the middle of the, uh, the, la of the last decade, uh, it was the majority of the region that was governed by left governments. Um, and so, yeah, they, they kicked out the IMF pretty much. I mean, in, in Argentina, they had to do it in order to recover. In fact, they even defaulted temporarily to the IMF in 2003 in September, and uh, that was under Nestor Kirchner. And that, uh, that was amazing because they didn't know what was going to happen. The IMF could have just totally destroyed them. Uh, could have blocked them from getting 
even trade credits for day-to-day -day, uh, business. And they didn't. They backed down, actually. But that was the end of the IMF in Argentina. And then the Brazil paid them off uh, to get rid of them a couple of years later. And then pretty soon, the whole, almost the whole region didn't really borrow from the IMF. Evo Morales was elected. They were under IMF agreements for uh, 19 uh, years straight. Uh, and when Evo was elected, and then he said no more. Uh, and at that time, their income per person was less than it had been 28 years earlier. That's how much the IMF uh, supervision really failed. And, and then, of course, they've done, they all did much better in the 21st century. In the last couple of years, they've, you know, there's been a recession in the, in the region. Uh, but for a whole, uh, more than a decade, they did very well. And did, can I ask you something about uh, Ecuador in particular? Um, now, uh, of course, um, uh, we, had a, we have a president in Ecuador that is an economist and perhaps had studied what the impact of the World Bank and IMF policies had been in Latin America. So he could come a bit more sure-footed in terms of rejecting the IMF. Um, and did, was that helpful in terms of Ecuador? Oh, yeah. I think they did the best in terms of in, instituting really important reforms. Well, first thing they did was they took over the central bank. So one of these neoliberal principles is that the central bank is supposed to be independent of the rest of the government. And almost all economists actually believe that, or the vast majority. And the, the government of Ecuador said, no, we need to have the central bank be part of our economic planning and our economic uh, cabinet. And so they did that. And then they put a requirement on all banks that they had to bring their foreign assets uh, back into the country, a big percentage of them. Um, and they enforced that. And they needed those dollars, uh, for example, during the Great Recession. Uh, and they implemented a whole set of financial reforms, some of which we could use here, actually, um, to protect them from the kind of financial collapses that you saw elsewhere. And uh, so they were really, uh, they had some of the best economic policies, a lot of uh, public investment. And yeah, I think they did very well. Bolivia did very well. Each of these countries you can look at, well, you can look at the whole region, for example, the regional statistics uh, from you know, 2003 to 2013. Uh, poverty fell from 44% of the region to 28%. And the prior 20 years, it had been increasing. So uh, yeah, 20 years of you know, no progress on, on poverty. And, and then you had uh, a lot. And this was a lot of it was due to uh, economic policy changes uh, by these left governments that they never would have been able to do uh, if they still were under the IMF. The uh, Bolivian government nationalized its, uh, renationalized its hydrocarbons, which mostly natural gas. This is something the IMF wouldn't let them do under those. Uh, agreements. They, so they had a huge increase in government revenue, and they used it you know, for public investment, to lower the retirement age, to stimulate the economy. All of these things would not have been possible. So that was a big change. And, and the, the collapse of the IMF's power over low- and middle-income countries during this period uh, is one of the biggest changes in the entire international uh, financial system. And as I said, it's gotten very, very little attention. Uh, has that been the case when it comes to uh, Greece, where IMF has played a very critical and important role as a part of the Troika, and even tried to, in the last set of negotiations, tried to pressure uh, the uh, e Europe and Germany and others to give um, Greece what they call a haircut, a, a reduction in what is owed uh, to them. That's uh, right. They want debt relief, so they're fighting with the rest of the European authorities on that. Well, it's, you know, I think the thing you have to remember about the IMF is it has a board of governors and an, and, uh, an executive board. And so that, the IMF is mostly run by the United States Treasury Department in most places in the world. And of course, in the poorest countries where it still has that creditor's cartel where they can really force governments to do things, like in Jamaica, for example, where they have the same power that they always they used to have in, in, in Latin America. Uh, so you, you, but, but when you go to Europe, 
then it's the European directors that are telling the IMF what to do. So the IMF is the junior partner in Europe. And this fight you've been seeing in the last uh, six months or so between the IMF and the rest of them, the rest of the European authorities on whether you, Greece has to have a, some debt reduction in order to go forward, that's mostly a fight between the US government and the European authorities. If the US was in agreement with the European authorities, then the IMF would just shut up and they wouldn't uh, say anything uh, about their differences with the other authorities. So that's mostly what you're seeing there. It is significant though, because it basically reflects the US uh, kind of imperial and geopolitical interests. They don't want to see Greece forced out of the Euro for their own reasons, you know? They supported all kinds of uh, terrible dictatorship and atrocities to keep Greece within the, the Western uh, uh, fold. And, uh, because it's an important economic... Uh, strategically, strategically, they consider it important. Yeah. Whereas the Germans, you know, and the European authorities, they're looking at more in terms of this, this uh, neoliberal project that they have for all of Europe and forcing Greece and everybody else, you know, like Wolfgang Schäuble said to Yanis Varoufakis, it's about discipline. You know, we have to, you know, if gives Greece something, then Spain is going to want to do something more sensible. And, you know, you got to remember all of this austerity in Europe is, is and the suffering there is completely unnecessary. You have, you have no, uh, infl inflation is less than 1% in Europe. So they can create money, they can bail out the banks, they can have uh, expansionary fiscal policy, and it, it doesn't cost them and anything. And still make money. Yeah, and it wouldn't cost them anything. Um, um, it'll be interesting to watch. Now, uh, one of the things about the uh, IMF um, you mentioned earlier um, is that they themselves are going through some assessment where they are um, wondering about whether neoliberalism has been oversold, as you indicated. Um, does that mean they're going to uh, change their strategic approach to how they um, deal with middle-income countries and poorer countries? Well, I would like to think so, but so far we don't have much to show for it. Uh, you, you don't have real changes in their economic policy. Now, as I said, in Europe, they're not really the main decision maker. Uh, but in the, I mean, in the countries where they really do have power, well, you can look at the, the Great Recession, you know, uh, 2009. We looked at uh, 41 countries that signed uh, they had I, operating IMF under IMF agreements towards the end of 2008, and uh, 31 of those had what we would call, economists would call, pro-cyclical policies. That is, policies that made the economy worse. In other words, that would tend to slow the economy if it was in recession or already uh, slowing down. It would make it worse, and both, uh, you know, fiscal, uh, monetary, or both. And so they didn't really change then. Uh, if you look at the, uh, if you look at their policies as expressed in their, uh, what are called Article Four agreements in Europe, still the same kind of things. Which uh, are agreements they enter into uh, with finance departments well, Article of four, each country? Well, uh, Article Four agreements are something that every country that's a member of the IMF has to have regular consultations with the IMF, and then they produce a paper, and the paper has you know, kind of the state of the economy and policy agreements. And that's where you see these uh, and policy recommendations. And that's where you see all these recommendations that have been implemented in, in Europe in recent years, like the cuts in healthcare spending and pensions and weakening the power of labor unions, increasing labor supply, and those kinds of things. So the IMF hasn't really changed its practice uh, much at all, very, very little. Uh, it's mostly just some changes in the research. Even department. when they concede in cases like Bolivia that uh, that uh, their pursuit of the policies that they pursued were actually successful in Bolivia. That's right. They have kind of conceded that, uh, and it doesn't really change uh, what they recommend. And I think it's because it's you know again, we have all these 
big questions here that are coming to the fore in the media now. You have Brexit, you have the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and so-called trade agreements are being a huge issue in the U.S. presidential elections, and you have this populist revolt. And it's the same question, really. You know, what is the IMF? It's this organization that is run by the rich countries completely, and it's determining policy where they can for poorer uh, countries and developing countries. And, of course, they're also helping determine policy and in, in implement it in Europe. And why are they? They're completely unaccountable to the people who are having to, being forced to take their advice. And so that's, that's the fundamental problem. You know, what you're seeing in Europe is just kind of the IMF uh, kind of policies that developing countries have suffered under for decades, now being implemented in the more vulnerable countries in Europe. But it's the same thing, and it's also, of course, a long-term failure of neoliberal uh, policies, uh, and you know, in almost all the places where they've been implemented. And that's something that your book was very good at doing, which is to sort of plot the long-term nature of these uh, failures. And uh, and um, so here we have a situation now in Europe. Um, time and time again, you know, the the um, countries um, have uh, failed in terms of their e economic goals and objectives and taking care of their populations. As we mentioned in the first segment, uh, yeah, you know, we have this situation where places like Spain, you know, there's 50% unemployment when it comes to youth. Um, it's equally high in, in places like Greece and uh, Portugal, or at least almost as high. And uh, we've seen signs of it in France, you know, with the st young people joining the labor uh, protests that are going on and, and protesting the, the, uh, the policies that are being uh, implemented by decree, you know. And, uh, and so um, is there going to be any kind of change uh, even when the, when the IMF it itself is admitting that this, uh, these policies have contributed to inequality around the world? And after Piketty's study, which became so... Uh, profound in the economic uh, dialogue, uh, how can they continue to ignore it? Because they don't have to answer to anyone. That's the, f again, that's the problem. You know, in a way, you don't even need any economics to understand. I mean, if you have a country, if you have an organization that is not accountable to any electorate, and uh, in, in this case of the IMF, it's run by the rich countries, do you expect it? to look out for the interests of the poorer countries in, in the world. You expect the Chamber of Commerce to look out for, you know, make sure that labor law is enforced, that workers can organize unions in the United States? They're not gonna do that. So in terms of that kind of change, you're not gonna see it. The big change came by people voting with their feet, by the vast majority of low and middle income countries getting out of the IMF's agreements, okay? That's what really, ha that's what was a big part of the big rebound you saw in economic growth and poverty reduction in the first decade of the 21st century. They lost that power. Now you can look at Europe and you can look at it two ways. You know, is, are the European authorities gonna change or is the Euro Eurozone gonna break up and maybe even the European Union? I think the jury's still out on that. But one of those two things is going to happen. They're gonna to have to change their policies a lot or uh, countries are going to start leaving. All right, uh, Mark, uh, in our next segment, let's uh, take a look at Latin America specifically. Why did they did so well um, in the period you outlined between 2020 uh, 15, and then the kind of crisis they're now dealing with in the in the recent uh, years. And, and uh, please stay tuned, and we'll be coming back with Mark Weisbrot. Thanks for joining us.